Fantastic. Everybody, welcome Good aboard. We're excited to be here with Michael W. Smith from HardcoreChristianity.com. And um, Michael, would you like to open us in prayer? I would. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Father God, I'm back on Omega Man Radio, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, I'm pray, praying as usual that you will bless my friends, my listeners, and uh, all of the people that he reaches every day with this program. I sure thank you for that. It's impressive. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless your word and uh, let me uh, help somebody today. Amen. Amen. Michael, before we get started, uh, pull your mic away from the mouth about one inch. We got it too close. How's that sound? Is that any better? That's better. I think you got it. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Friends, welcome okay. aboard. Uh, we're going to continue. Today is uh, first day of the week. Welcome. Uh, broadcasting, that is. Monday, June 19th, 2023. Welcome back. And uh, Brother Michael, the mic is yours. Thank you, sir. Great to be back. I want to share some um, uh, some uh, personal information uh, out of Second Kings chapter five. This story doesn't seem to relate to anybody, but if you take a closer look at it, there's a lot of uh, Christian psychology in the in the story. Everybody has read this story. It's very it's a very popular one. It's about the the great prophet Elisha. But um, you know the story when. Uh, a great warrior from Syria, a guy named uh, Nehemon. Um, he's a very popular person in Syria, you know, kind of like uh, Muhammad Ali or something. A very famous person. Everybody knows who he is. The king of Syria thinks he's the greatest thing in the world. He's a uh, powerful warrior. He's uh, conquered all kinds of peoples, particularly the uh, the Amorites. He's also conquered part of the, part of the Jewish people. Uh, the guy was impressive, but he had one problem, and you know what it was? It was leprosy. The guy was a leper, so he lived a, an unusual life. As you know, leprosy can be transmitted by touch, so he kind of lived an isolated life, even though he was among a lot of people. Uh, he left, lost a lot of his life when he came down with leprosy. He was married, he had kids, he had a family, but he couldn't hug them anymore. He couldn't have any personal close contact with anybody anymore. He just basically did his job as a warrior and a father, Second Kings chapter, chapter 5. And uh, one day, uh, a Jewish girl, a young girl, who uh, was a, uh, a servant in their household. This uh, young Jewish girl was a, a personal servant of his wife. And she says to him, you know, if, uh, if you could get your husband to go visit the prophet of Israel, Elisha, he, he could recover from his leprosy and live a normal life again. Well, his wife hears this from the from the young girl, and then she goes to him and she says, "Hey, you know this prophet in Israel. Apparently, he's the real deal. You need to go see him, and you can get healed of leprosy." So Naaman goes, "Well, let me run it past the king," and he does. And the king goes, "Hey, of course. What are you talking about? Go, go ahead. I'll I'll write a letter and send a messenger before you, and I'll get this thing all cleared up." Of course, go go see this guy. So that's what happens. He packs up his stuff, you know, a dozen or so mules, a bunch of servants, loads the mules down with all kinds of travel gear, including hundreds and hundreds of pounds of silver coins, a huge amount of money, like hitting the lottery. And uh, the king sends a messenger to uh, Israel, and says to the king, hey, listen, Nehemon is our great warrior. He's coming here to get healed of leprosy. And you guys have a prophet here, and you guys can heal people of leprosy. Well, the king of Israel uh, starts panicking, as you know. He starts to freak. 
because he can't cure anybody of anything, including himself. And so he thinks it's a trick. He thinks that uh, Syria is going to try attack again. He thinks they're going to start a war because uh, when he explains to him, hey, we don't heal leprosy around here. You've got the wrong people. That's going to trigger a war. They're going to they're going to be insulted by it. Well, fortunately for them, um, Elisha happened to be in town, and uh, he was probably at the local Walmart and getting supplies and food and different things. And he happens to hear about the story. Well, he goes to the king and says, "Tell him to come, and that way he'll know there's a there's a prophet in in Israel." And so that's what happened. They, Israel sent a messenger gave the information to the messenger. He ran back to Syria, and uh, Nehemon headed out with his, with his troop, with his group. And uh, they came to Israel and went right to Elisha's house. They found out where he lived. And before he got there, Elisha sends him a messenger. Everybody in this story seems to send messengers. Well, the messenger runs out and says, Hey, um, Go down to the River Jordan, take a dunk seven times, go in the water and dunk yourself, and then come out and do that seven times, and on the seventh time, you'll be cured of your leprosy. Well, Nahaman freaks out. Okay, the guy is a uh, big shot in Syria. He's got a huge ego. He's a uh, type A alpha male and uh, people that are big shots alpha males uh, they're treated differently than regular people so he was expecting Elisha to come out you know pull a bolt of lightning out of the sky uh, thunder uh, give him a giant proclamation of something and the leprosy would then disappear when he you know, touched him with the staff. I don't know what he was thinking, but he, he was looking for a big ceremony like they had in Syria. Everybody has big ceremonies. And in America, churches are very much like that. They have big ceremonies. You know, if you, Acts 29, uh, Mars Hill, Hillsong, they got huge ceremonies in their churches. Now, obviously, you know, they don't mount to much. And uh, Nahum, Nahaman says, I'm leaving. This is, this is ridiculous. Well, they had, had to go back home to Syria, and a couple of his servants that came with him said, wait a minute. Uh, listen, we're here already, and you know nobody's going to know anything about this. We don't, we're not going to tell anybody. Why don't you just do it? It's not going to cost anything. And Nehemiah goes, well, that doesn't make any sense. This, this River Jordan is dirty, mucky water. It stinks. You can't see in it. It's not clear. It's muddy. The, the rivers in Syria, look, they're clear. You can see down five feet in it. They're beautiful. And the servants prevail against him. And they respectfully keep saying, you know, I understand that. I agree with everything you're saying. Oh, wonderful one. You know, but hey, we're here. Why not? Just go ahead and do it. You know, nobody's going to know. What, what's, what's it going to take? Seven dunks? Yeah, let's just do it. So the guy acquiesces. He agrees. And sure enough, he goes down and he dunks seven times. In the River Jordan, and that's where Jesus dunked. And the incredible Holy Ghost came down, the one and only. This was in the River Jordan, the dirty waters of Jordan. He comes out the seventh time, and an unbelievable miracle occurs. Absolutely amazing. His skin was feces-type looking. You know, it had huge white blotches on it with black specks in it. Uh, the skin was flaking off. Like it would scab, and then it would fall off. Uh, he stunk. His skin stunk. 
He looked dirty all the time. He wore long sleeves, this and that, to cover it up. He wore armor to cover up his legs. Cosmetically, he had to fix it. And his skin was like a baby's, literally. It was so healed, it was amazing. He come up out of the water six times. He looks down at his arms and nothing. He comes up the seventh time. He comes up the seventh time. And he looked down and it says his flesh was like a baby. A nahar in Hebrew is, is a youngster, a child, probably a grade schooler or something kindergartner just perfect nobody could believe it well they turn around and go back and this time something interesting occurs they get to Elisha's house and he does come out and see them this time before he wouldn't come out because he was a man of arrogance and I can't tell you over the years how many Christians I've seen in my counseling practice that lost their call from God and lost their anointing because the devil hit them with one of his greatest tricks. When someone starts to become successful in the ministry, the devil uh, pulls an end around on them. He starts to attack them viciously with compliments. He starts to hit them with praise. And the minister starts to fall for it after a while. They actually start to believe their own press. And the demons make sure that everybody who has the anointing uh, is surrounded by what I call yes men, people that agree with everything you're doing, people who think you're wonderful, people who think you're doing a great job, people who think you're great, people who think you're fantastically anointed, people who think you're a great man or woman of God. And they, the demons deliberately surround them with these kinds of people. And what happens is that is the root foundation for scandals. When you have people around you that like you too much, love you too much, agree with you too much, support you too much, codependent you too much, that's a recipe for a disaster. Because when you start to make mistakes, when you start to fail, when you start to sin, when you start to overstep your bounds, when you start to overstep your authority, the people that the devil sent to you to surround you and compliment you and praise you and support you and help you also are the ones who cover up what you're doing. They cover up what you're doing. Because all these people the devil sent to puff you up, have so much invested in you and benefit so much from your anointing and your ministry that it becomes an, a system of self-preservation to cover up all your failures. And that's exactly what happens to churches like Hillsong, where you have numerous people surrounded by a powerful support staff who covers up when the person starts to fail and when the person starts to sin. Pride and arrogance are, are like a cancer to a Holy Ghost ministry. If you look back over the decades, just here in America, 
the great Holy Ghost preachers, the people that had the power of the Holy Ghost, the manifestation of the Spirit for healing and deliverance and everything else, these people were all very humble people. They, they all were very grateful for what they'd received from God. If you look at Mary Wordworth Etter, you look at Smith Wigglesworth, John Lake, A. A. Allen, Oral Roberts in the early years, all these people. There's a rack, there's racks of them. They were all very humble people, and they were all very grateful people, grateful for what they had, grateful for what God gave them. Well, you can destroy that gratefulness, and you can beat it out of a person by complimenting them. You did a great job on your sermon. You're doing a great job preaching. Oh, gosh, your anointing is so fantastic. Oh, your wisdom is off the chart. And this, this uh, deluge of positivity ends up being the vehicle that destroys them. And you can see that in Southern Baptist Convention and Hillsong and all these major, major religions. At the root of it is always a system of pride and arrogance and people being puffed up. Well, Elisha wouldn't have any of that. He wouldn't come out and even see the guy. He just told him to go wash. And when Nehemiah repented and humbled himself and came back, then Elisha came out to see him. And only then would he see the guy. Well, you know, the, this portion of the story, he wanted to give him gifts, not to bribe him. He gave it out of a good heart. He wanted to give the man of God gifts for this incredible miracle and for saving his life. The guy was terminally ill and now he's going to live. Well, Elisha wasn't stupid enough to do it because he knew that God had done all the miracle work and that he didn't feel comfortable getting paid for something that Jehovah had done. And so Nehemiah says to him, well, listen, I know for sure now that Jehovah is God. There are no other gods. All the other gods are fake gods. We got a bunch of gods in Syria, Remen being one of them. I know they're fake gods, but I need to ask you for mercy because I have to go into the temple of these gods. One of them is Remen, and I've got to go in there with the king. And when he bows, I got to bow, but I want to ask you to forgive me for that. I don't believe in that God. I only believe now in Jehovah, the great God of the Hebrews. And then Elisha granted him peace in that matter. And then he le he leaves. And then something really interesting happens. Gehazi is Elisha's number one servant, been with him for years. They were close personal friends. But. Gehazi had let the devil put into his soul a little seed, a little seed of having something for himself. He always had this deep-seated desire to have his own farm, his own land, his own vineyards, his own crops, his own family. That was his always kind of a deep-seated interests of his, like a fantasy, like, like a dream. He always had a deep-seated dream. Hey, I'd like to have something for me. I'd like to have success for myself. I've been serving Elisha all these years. I've been my second fiddle over here. Someday I'd like to be somebody. You know, it's like he had the Jesse Jackson syndrome. I am somebody. And that's what he wanted to be. And he had all these desires, but he never said anything. Nobody ever knew it. Well, when he saw all that money, you know, 300, 350 pounds of silver coins in those sacks, all the talents, a talent was somewhere around 70, 80, 90 pounds, something like that. He wanted to give Elisha a couple of talents. That's a lot of money. That was like hitting the lottery. 
and he saw those all those new clothes he saw all the wealth and and finally this was his chance to fulfill his dream he had a dream he had a dream of being somebody and having something and so when Nehemiah left, he gets followed. And Gehazi catches up with him on the trail. And as you know, he stops for him and runs to him. Says, hey, what's going on? It's all well. And, and, and then Gehazi makes up a story. He lies to him. Oh, this, these other prophets came and they need they needed some provisions. They need some money. They need somebody to take care of them. We don't we don't have enough to supply them. Uh, could we have a uh, seventy or eighty pounds of that silver? Could we have some changes of clothes for them? Could we have this? Could we have that? This is all for charity work. We're giving it to people who are needy, and that's how a lot of Christians do today. They'll They'll put money in the offering. They'll help the sick. They'll minister to the homeless. They'll, make, they'll give them clothes. They'll give them food and so on. Some of them do it to ease their conscience. Some of them do it out of a good heart. And But Gehazi just makes up the story, literally cooked it up. And, of course, he gave it to him. He said, hey, don't, don't take one talent. Take two. So now, now he's got, you know, 300, three, 400 pounds of silver coins. He's rich. He's rich. And he even sends his servants back to help him take it back. And so instead of going to Elisha's house, Gehazi goes to a tower and stashes it. He hides it. Then he dismisses the servants of uh, Naaman and they go back. Remember the story? Of course you do. And then he goes back to Elisha's house to go back to his normal duties. So now everything in his heart is set. His dreams have come true. He always had this dream to be a wealthy landowner and to have vineyards and maid servants and all kinds of stuff. He wanted a, his own servants. He wanted to be the boss. He wanted to have olive groves. He wanted to have grapes he wanted to have slaves this was this was his dream he wanted to be a wealthy landowner he didn't want to just be a servant the rest of his life even though it was the greatest privilege and the greatest honor he could ever be ever have at that time to be elisha's right hand man no question he saw all the miracles of elisha and elisha had twice as many miracles as elijah utterly incredible and then he comes back to Elisha's house, and then Elisha, God had revealed to him what had happened. And he knew all about it. And now it's, now we got real problems. And Gehazi is then stricken with with leprosy and and his family his family and his future family was going to be plagued with leprosy the whole family tree from Gehazi down got hit with the curse of leprosy because of what he did and apparently it was a fairly bad stage of leprosy. My guess is it was the same stage that Nahum, uh, Nahamon had. It says that his skin, skin looked snowy. And he left that day crushed. But he never gave back the money. never gave back the silver. 
he didn't give back the clothes. And what's really interesting is that Elisha and Jehovah had mercy on him and let him keep his servant's job. If you go forward a few chapters, you'll see in chapter 8 of Second Kings that Gehazi is still called the servant of Elisha. And God had mercy on him. And so did Elisha. They never got rid of him. He just had to live now like Nehemon used to live. Covering up your skin, not touching anybody, watching yourself, constantly taking care of your physical needs. He started to stink like Nehemon. His skin started flaking off like him. Everything that came from Syria, the demons dumped on him. In a way, it was a very sad story, but the root of the story was the devil comes to us and puts little bitty seeds of sin inside of us. He puts little seeds in there. And they don't amount to anything. For a while. Then. Yikes. It starts to grow. And that's what happens to him over the years. He saw Elisha turning down all these gifts and all this money that could have come in to set everybody up for life. The same thing happened to Judas. The exact same thing happened to Judas. Jesus kept, in his mind, wasting money. And that drove Judas crazy. He was raised poor. He always wanted to have something. He always wanted to be somebody. And the trigger that turned Judas into the betrayer was a uh, broken down prostitute. Mary Magdalena came into Simon's house and anointed Jesus with oil. She took an alabaster box and that was a marble container that had extremely expensive myrrh in it that was imported from India. And these uh, alabaster boxes, the Greek word is alabastrum, was, was uh, imported from Egypt. It was, it was white marble. It was very expensive. Well, she breaks the seal off the top of this thing. Kind of as a symbol that she's never going back to her old life of prostitution and whoredom. That it, and it's over. And she had gotten massively delivered from demons. The Bible says she had seven demons cast out of her. Those couldn't have been just regular demons. Those must have been seven entities or something like that. Over the years in my deliverance ministry, I seen hundreds of people can't get rid of a lot more than just seven demons. So these had to be some kind of controller spirits, big ones, huge ones, demons on steroids, so to speak. Seven of them came out, monsters. And Mary Magdalena was incredibly grateful. And there was no way she was going back to prostitution. She had found a new life in Christ. She was a new creation in Christ. And when Judas saw her break the seal off that alabaster box, that beautiful marble container, and all that 
fancy myrrh pour out and the aroma of it would go you know half a block it had to fill simon's house he he went ballistic finally that little seed the devil had put in judas exploded gehazi's seed exploded when he saw the bags of silver he couldn't believe it and he said to himself this is my chance to have everything I always dreamed of having this was my chance and he yielded over to what Satan had planted in him just like Judas did that seed of greed that he had planted in Judas exploded that day when she broke that alabaster box and poured that myrrh on Jesus and anointed him for his burial remember that story I'm sure you do it's a fantastic story the devil comes along and he puts a little seed in you places it in there sometimes it goes in unnoticed it's a little seed of jealousy a little seed of frustration a little desire for something that you know God would prefer you don't have or prefer you don't have at this time it could be anything it could be a material thing it could be a person anything like that and that seed eventually germinates and explodes in people you know when Jesus was uh, going to be arrested the night of his arrest he said to the disciples something really interesting he said the prince of darkness is coming for me tonight but he has nothing in me that's the Greek word n for in there and en it means inside he said the devil's coming for me tonight but he doesn't have anything in me and that's exactly how Satan controls Christians he puts something inside them that he can use later that will grow slowly grow until it explodes years ago Jimmy Swaggart when he was young the great evangelist him and his cousin Jerry Lee Lewis the rock star when they were kids they were cousins and when they were kids Jimmy and Jerry Lee used to sneak over at night Friday nights and peek in the back windows of the honky-tonk and uh, they used to watch the dancing girls perform in the bar and when they were doing that Satan put a lust demon inside Jerry Lee Lewis and Jimmy Swagger they picked up a lust demon and that lust demon got in sometimes it's like a little seed but as you water it as you yield to it it starts growing it starts to get big it gets huge and at some point at some point it explodes a few years later that lust demon attacked Jerry Lee and he started having sex with his cousin and she was 12 years old at the time years later that lust demon exploded in Jimmy Swagger that seed of when he was 
grade school, the demons put, puts a little seed of something in you. Jimmy got hit at the honky tonk. And there it was. That's how the Jimmy Swagger scandal exploded in the United States. It was a massive scandal. Jimmy had been going to prostitutes and he would he was a voyeur just like he was in grade school. It was the exact same demon. He would go to prostitutes and they would dance for him. They would parade around for him. That's exactly the same demon that hit him when he was young with Jerry Lee. He liked to watch sexually attractive women. And it got in when he was in grade school. Jerry Lee, is half of his career exploded. He never recovered. Even after he married his cousin, the scandal was so big. And at the time it happened, Jerry Lee Lewis was bigger star than Elvis Presley. And his entire career tanked after they found out that he had been sleeping with his 12-year-old cousin. I think he just died a couple of months ago, too. I can't remember, but exactly. I think it was this year. But the point I'm trying to make is Gehazi had this seed in him. Judas had a seed in him. Jimmy and Jerry had seeds in them that the devil had planted in their soul months, years, decades, even longer, earlier. The time element is not the key. It's the fact that these little demonic urges get planted in the person's soul, and then later on, the devil uses them as insurance. <clears throat> That's what you buy fire insurance for. You pay a premium every year. Your house doesn't burn down. You don't get your premium back. But you pay again next year in the event that the house burns down. Demons put seeds of destruction in human beings' souls in the event that later on they become born-again Christians and their spirit man is filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that little seed they planted in the soul can still destroy their Christian life, even though they have been filled with the Spirit in their spirit man. Here, I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you how it happens. The great Apostle James explained everything I just said about the story in 2 Kings chapter 5. and did a lot better job than I'm doing. Check this out. James chapter 1. Verse 13, it says that, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Okay, what that actually says, the Greek, the word tempted there is the Greek word piazzo. Piazzo is a Greek word that means to test. Everyone who's tempted is being tested. It's a test. But it says, God is not doing the testing because God cannot be tested with evil. That's the Greek word kakos. It means bad things. God can't be tested with bad things. Neither does he ever test any man. So this seed that the devil plants in the person is a the result of some kind of a test the person failed or an opening mentally or emotionally that the person has. The devil plants a little seed in there. And at the time he plants the seed, it can't do anything because it has to be watered and it has to grow. 
Well, in the next verse, James explains it. He says, quote, verse 14, but every man is tested, Pirazzo, when he is drawn away, that's the Greek word ex elko, it means to drag someone. You would grab their arm and start pulling them or dragging them. It says here, every man is tested when he's dragged or pulled away of his own lust. The Greek word for lust there is epithemia, means it means uh, sinful passions. And enticed. Deliazo means trapped. So you see, the devil came looking for Jesus on the night he was arrested and couldn't get him because he had nothing in him. He had never been able to plant any seeds in Jesus. There was nothing in there for him to drag him and trap him. James 1.14. But Christians are not that way, obviously. We are not Christ. We're not, we weren't born like he was. We didn't live like he, he lived. We do have these seeds hiding in us, and the devil's trying to drag us into a trap using these lusts that are inside of us. And if you think about it for a second, it makes perfect intellectual sense, doesn't it? The devil doesn't try to tempt you with things that are not going to affect you. They're not going to send, you know, a transvestite over to your house. I'm trying to get you to go to a drag queen story hour. I don't think Shannon's going to do that. That's not going to happen. And as a result, and I don't think drag queens come to your house because that's not going to work. There's nothing in you that would, they would be able to drag you to a drag queen story hour. It's not going to happen. No, that's not how it works. The devil analyzes each Christian individually, separately. Every one of them were broken down and analyzed, almost like a forensic autopsy. And they find your weak spots. They find where your seeds are. They find things inside you that they can use as an asset. And then they try to drag you through your lusts, your own lusts, into a trap. That's exactly what happened to Gehazi. That's exactly what happened to Judas, those four people. They both died because of their little seed that grew, that the devil drugged them into a trap, and then he killed them. Judas died by suicide. Gehazi died by was terminally ill from leprosy. And so that's why Brother Paul taught everyone, listen, let a man examine himself to see whether he is in the faith. The greatest skill you could ever develop as a minister of, gospel, of the gospel Whatever you're called to do, the greatest skill you can ever develop is self-analysis. Your ability to analyze yourself. The devil won't help you do that under any circumstances, but he will give you great discernment and a wonderful anointing to analyze others. He'll teach you how to nitpick and criticize others so fast you won't believe it. He'll become an expert in two days. But he will never allow you to analyze yourself. Because if you learn to do that, you would then start to remove through deliverance, through fasting, through prayer, through the word of God, all of those little things the devil planted in you Insecurity, low self-esteem, rejection, lust, anger, bitterness, jealousy, resentment, taking offenses, 
whatever those little seeds are inside of you, if you developed self-awareness and self-analysis, you would remove them through the anointing and your anointing would increase, your call would increase and your power from God would increase dramatically. But the key to everything is, and the thought I want to leave you with, is that whatever's inside you is what the spirit world wants to draw out. So if Satan implants something in you, he wants to draw it out. If the Holy Spirit implants the fruit of the Spirit in you, he wants to draw it out. If God implants a calling or a ministry into your spirit man, he wants to draw it out. If the devil implants implants lust, Jerry Lee Lewis, Jimmy Swagger, if he implants lust as a young man, youngster a young child he wants to draw it out later and that's exactly what happened jerry lee lewis's life blew up jimmy swaggart's life blew up twice twice he got caught twice going to watch prostitutes twice it happened everybody forgave him the first time then he did it again Why? Because nobody understood the Bible study I'm sharing with you today. They didn't understand how this thing works. Assembly of God Pentecostals don't understand the spirit world very well. They don't understand the subtleties of demonic influence. And neither did Gehazi and neither did Judas. That's why he hung himself. Once the devil plants something inside of you, he will nurture it, he will water it, he will bless it, he will make it grow. And then at an opportune time, it will explode. It exploded when Gehazi saw all that money. It exploded when she went Jimmy Swagger saw that prostitute at the mall. She was beautiful. It exploded when Jerry Lee let the demons put love and lust in his heart for his 12-year-old cousin. It exploded when Judas saw that alabaster box seal break off there. And when he saw her pour all of the contents of it, thousands of dollars worth of imported Myrrh poured on Jesus, Son of God. When he saw that, boom, the seed of greed exploded. And so, when you see a born again Christian, if you're in the ministry right now, sometimes it's, it's productive to look at Christians as walking time bombs. I, I know that's not a doesn't seem like a nice thing to say, but Actually, it's a very helpful thing to say. If you look at Christians as a walking time bob, if you're going to minister to them, like I do in my counseling practice, I hunt for the bomb. Because I know, James chapter 1, that Christians fail because there's something in them. The devil drags out of them and traps them with through their own lusts. And then verse 15 says, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death, temporary or permanent. That's what happened. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis's career died that day. Uh, He resurrected a little bit of it, but never made it back. Jimmy Swaggart's ministry, died that day after he got caught the second time. He was out of pocket for years. God had mercy on him like he did Gehazi and gave him some of his ministry back. Uh, His ministry is booming today in Baton Rouge. Place is booming over there. Gehazi stayed 
the servant of Elisha, but still had to die, and his whole family died of leprosy. And the key to you helping people is to help them find the little seeds the devil planted in them so that they can eventually say, the devil is coming for me today, but he has nothing in me. Great teaching, my friend. Great teaching. Folks, we're live with Michael W. Smith. What shall we call this today for the archive? Well, that's a good one. <laughs> you got any thoughts? Huh. Well... How about emotional leprosy? Oh, I like that one. <laughs> okay, that'll be good. Emotional leprosy. Fantastic. That's what Gehazi had. Emotional leprosy. Wow. What a, what a, what an awesome teaching here. Michael, I want you to tell people how they can reach your ministry. And uh, you do teaching online. Where do they go to tune in? Oh, thank you. A um, couple of places. Uh, number one is uh, our YouTube teaching channel, and we're also on Rumble, a couple of others. But go to youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. All my teachings are on there. We have two live services every week, Thursday and Friday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And those both those services are live on uh, YouTube. And the deliverance service is also live. I teach on Friday nights, so I leave my mic on, and you can hear the conversations of me ministering to people. You can hear them repenting. You can hear them being delivered. It's a interesting learning experience. You can see the things that I do right and repeat them, the things I do wrong, and then you, you don't do them. And uh, it's really, really interesting to hear these people getting delivered Friday nights uh, 7 p.m. Pacific. Thursday nights, Brother Rick teaches on Thursday nights at 7. That's also on our YouTube channel. I also have a podcast on uh, Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock Pacific time. You just go to twitch.tv. Uh, I've had a podcast um, since Shannon, Shannon told me to get on, on Twitch several months ago. I think it was about eight months now. So I did, and uh, it's worked out great. Twitch.tv, you just put in H-C-C-H-O-H, that stands for Hardcore Christianity House of Healing, H-C-C-H-O-H, and you're there on uh, Twitch.tv. Thank you. Also, uh, if you send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, I'll send you a um, religious exemption if you need one for the next virus hoax. If you need a someone who needs to be healed or delivered and they can't come to the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix, I'll send you out the Miracle List, which is a step-by-step -step guide to healing and deliverance. It works 100% of the time for people that do it, and I'll email it out to you immediately. In addition, we have Zoom services Tuesday and Wednesday nights at uh, 6 p.m. and 6.30 Pacific time. I'll send you the uh, ID code and the password for that. If you'd like to join the healing service on Zoom. Now you also offer some um, training via your website for people that want to uh, learn more about deliverance. Is that still offered? Yes. What's that? Called? Yeah, on the on the uh, fourth Saturday of every month, I have a deliverance and uh, healing training class. It starts at noon Pacific time, and you can also catch that on. Uh, the, uh, YouTube site and uh, I go through uh, a teaching and training on how to do healing and deliverance I also have a uh, a training course it's 18 classes you can order that off the uh, website hardcorechristianity.com it's a flash drive unit you put into your wow 
laptop. It's 18 classes, and it shows you uh, exactly each step to go through to see people healed and delivered. And what's unique about that training flash drive is that um, every service, the Holy Spirit would deliver people demonstrating what I was teaching. So at the end of the teaching, these people would get delivered in the class illustrating what I was teaching so it's a very interesting learning experience and again you can look at some of the mistakes I made uh, during the deliverance sessions on the on that class and then you can avoid those and then you look at the the ones that I did that was productive and you can repeat them it's a great learning experience you can order it off the you just click the store button on the website at the top and you can order that training class that will save you a lot of time and energy and trouble and mistakes by taking that 18 class course oh man this is exciting folks you got to get this put it on the flash drive that's a cool concept hardcorechristianity.com um, Michael if someone would like to support the work do you have anything like PayPal or Cash App or Zelle or anything like that yeah we do thank you if that's on the website too just just uh, put hit the donate button and they're all on there now, one question for you. You're broadcasting on Twitch, and that is good. Are you taking the MP3 of the audios and archiving those as well? In other words, uh, you're doing a video uh, broadcast over there. Have you thought about taking the audio and turn that into a podcast as well? I don't think I don't think we're doing that. you got to consider that because okay. uh, for video... Okay, there's great platforms that you're on like Twitch, but there's a whole other world out there that's not into the video, and they're just about downloading the MP3 podcast. And so for that, all you got to do is just uh, strip the audio from your uh, video presentation, save it as an episode on a hard drive, and then if you want, you can choose any number of platforms like Podbean. I went to Podbean. Uh, dot com and you can set up a podcast over there or Spreaker that's very popular too and you have a whole dedicated M3, MP3 channel and that'll go out over dozens of networks just something to think about did yeah. you say pod beam B-E-A-M uh, yes sir pod like coffee bean P-O-D B-E-A-N dot com now pod bean or Spreaker S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com uh, okay. Those are two of the most popular, and all you do is you set up an account, and then um, you basically upload your, you start your podcast channel. It's audio only, and you upload your MP3s there. And they have an app now on Podbean, and um, it's really a, a great platform. I'm doing everything exclusively on Podbean now. I moved everything over. Okay. And so I set up two channels over there. I've got the the Omega Man, like uh, where we do our current programs, but then I've got one called the Omega Man Reloaded, which is where I'm remastering all 10,000 shows, starting with episode one. It's going to be a take a while, <laughs> but I'm, re- I'm releasing two per night, Monday through Friday, on the Reloaded channel. If you all go to OmegaManRadio.com, you can get the links right there. But uh, you've got to take that next step because your your pro- your your teaching is too important not to hit the podcast audio world just something to think about well thank you for that yes sir very simple to do uh brother michael always an honor to be here you're one of my favorite guest speakers we'll see you next time god bless you my friend thanks shannon thank you appreciate it bye-bye